my name is uh, Linda Matouche Rao, and this is Sunset Flower Farm. This is a 17-acre farm in Belle Plaine State Park. It's in Cape May County, New Jersey, and we are actually in the heart of the uh, Belle Plaine Forest. Our main crop is peonies. We also grow hydrangeas, sunflowers, and other flowering annual cut flowers. This video will focus on the cut flower industry, on the harvesting, the marketing, and getting the, the flowers to market to event planners, wholesalers, florists. So I hope this will be helpful in your decision on whether you want to be a flower farmer. Hi, I'm Jenny Carlio, Agricultural and Resource Management Agent for Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Cape May County. There are three considerations to think about when choosing to grow cut flowers. The delicate nature of the crop, weed control, and labor quantity and quality. Cut flowers are extremely delicate. Appearance is everything, but they are susceptible to many forms of damage, such as crushing, wilting, breaking, drying out, and different bacterial or fungal diseases if they're not handled properly. Unlike for most other crops, chemical weed control options are not readily available for cut flowers. Therefore, prevention is key. It's important to mulch and weed in a timely fashion. Mulching is important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we use mushroom soil here. I call it the magic soil because it has a lot of macro and micronutrients in it. And it's basically a compost and it's a very clean compost to use on your flowers. The third consideration is labor, quantity and quality. It's really easy to overplant too much acreage in the spring when there's not much else to do. But enough labor needs to be available for proper tending, handling, harvesting and weed control during the height of the season. Ah, oh, if I had a penny for every weed that I had. Uh, we weed by hand on the farm. Uh, we use different tools like a horseshoe hoe and a wheel hoe. And I have a crew of three young adults who are very hardworking. They show up to work and uh, they help us uh, get the farm groomed. Part of the plan that happens in the wintertime is that you want to schedule that weeding process on a weekly basis. So you want your crew out there at different levels to make sure that your fields are clear. Labor quality is also very important. All labor must be educated on proper handling techniques, storage, harvesting stages, and anything else that needs to be done for cut flower production. Being in the floral industry for over 30 years and running a flower shop, I knew what flowers would work the best. So I decided to um, choose peonies. We first started out with a test bed because the farm was basically a blank slate and we didn't really know how well they were going to grow. So of course we did a pH test and we wanted to see what the soil level was. We thought about the different varieties that we would grow and what would work. So we did a little research too. We started out with 300 varieties for the test bed. So once the test bed finally began to harvest, I knew that I definitely wanted to take my investment and go into peonies. So I decided to purchase over almost 7,000 peony roots. The reason why we did so many at a time is because we're older and in this industry it takes of course three years before you can harvest them. So we wanted to make sure that we had a very good harvest when they do come into play and become a commercial product. I planned them so they would be early, mid and late. No one wants to harvest 7,000 peonies all at once. So with that in mind, our commercial plan had worked. When choosing a field to grow cut flowers in, choose one with full sun, especially in the morning, and fertile, well-drained soil. Also avoid areas with early or late frost or a persistent perennial weed problem. Another thing to consider when choosing which field to plant is if you have a retail farm market. You may want to choose to plant the field close to the market to attract customers to come inside. What we do in the spring down on the farm here is we get our peonies ready. We put mushroom soil down on the actual plants and they haven't bloomed up yet because they're a perennial. And while that is going on, after we're done that, then we also prep our seed beds for our annuals. Now once those seed beds are prepped, then we go back and the peonies are starting to come up out of the ground, we are beginning to actually weed them. 
and we weed them by hand, believe it or not. <laughs> 7,000 peonies, you gotta think about that. <laughs> it's a lot of peonies to be on your hands and knees with. So we do that to make sure the air circulation goes around the peonies. You don't want any weeds around them because of insects and you want to make sure that the air circulation is around them. And then once they start keeping up and you keep up with the weeds on them, which takes weeks sometimes, we also go back to our seed beds. We take a soil temperature and make sure the soil is warm enough to plant the annual seeds. And once that is done, we basically um, take the tiller down, we rake it out so it's nice and smooth, and then you can sow your seeds. In the summer at Sunset Flower Farm, it's a very busy season. It's the time when the summer annuals come into play. And we harvest, we get up every morning, early in the morning, and we harvest all the fields as much as we can. Then, once that's done, once the harvesting is done, you're not really done done. You have to bring them back and process them, strip them, bundle them, get them in water, recut them again, and of course get them in water and put them in the refrigeration unit. As soon as a flower is harvested, the condition will begin to decline. So the idea is to keep it in that state, that fresh cut state, as long as possible. There are a few things you can do to preserve the flower. One is to remove the field heat as soon as possible. So get it cool and keep it cool as consistently as you can. Secondly, you can remove the leaves from the stem. This will inhibit transpiration, which is very important. You can also use a commercial floral preservative. Farmers should never skip using a commercial floral preservative because it has three major functions. The first is that it adds a food source to the water. The second is that it cleans the water using an antimicrobial agent. And the third is that it acidifies the water to prevent other diseases from coming in. It's a very busy time of year because not only are you harvesting your summer annuals, you have to consider the weeds that are still growing on your summer annual crops too. So you want to make sure that your weeds are done. Your weeding uh, program is continuous and your fertilizing is going on and also your irrigation. Make sure that as soon as you get up in the morning your irrigation is on because summer you're dealing with temperatures that are in the 90s and it's stressful for the cut flowers. And once that season's over then we start to slow down for the fall. In the fall, if you're lucky enough and you plant at your successions, you will have additional flowers for the fall. And at Sunset Flower Farm, we do because our season pretty much ends in October. We have additional sunflowers and the marigolds come into play. So we're still harvesting and processing and selling them at market. In addition to still doing that, uh, we take our peonies at this point and we have to cut our peonies down to the ground. And at that point, we have to take the lawnmower or whatever, we cut them all down and we bag all their leaves. Uh, we do not throw the leaves of the peonies into a compost pile, only because peonies are very susceptible to powdery mildew and you wouldn't want to take that disease and transfer it over to your compost pile. So we have to eliminate all those leaves. And then once that's done, we continue to groom the fields and get them ready for the next season. And some of the annuals that actually come up in early spring, uh, for instance, blue plurum and larkspur, you can plant in the fall so that they'll overwinter for you and they'll be ready for you for first to market in the early spring. And that's another additional uh, you know, task that we do on the farm. And then, of course, we gather all our hoses and everything has to be put away and buttoned down for the winter season. During the dormant season at the farm, we go around and we check for any perennials that need to be pruned, um, like sedum or the hydrangeas, and we do that on the farm. We also have a chance to put down a pre-emergence so that, um, you know, for weed control. In addition, we put down the uh, mushroom soil and the peonies before the actual buds start to come out of the ground for the spring. In the wintertime, I do quite a bit of research and figure out what is best for market and what's the going trend that's going on in the market. So the best thing to do is look at the wedding magazines, bridal magazines, do some research as far as um, reading books. Your seed catalogs will tell you everything you need to know. It's important to keep up to date on all of the new species and varieties that are available for the cut flower industry every year. So be sure to do your homework over the winter time. Investigate different things online and talk to members of your association. 
You want to make sure that your crop follows the market. The time to start selling something is before you plant it. So I get questions often about what varieties do you think I should grow as a grower? And I always have to start with who's your customer? What do they need? What are they asking for? as being the starting point of once again of the discussion. And then I often recommend to growers, go more narrow and more deep rather than wide. If you're gonna grow dahlias, instead of growing 40 varieties of dahlias, two plants of each, so you have seven stems every single week of 40 different varieties, maybe when you start, talk to your customer, find out the five best selling varieties year round for them and grow 40 plants of five varieties so that you have a decent amount to ship a wholesale customer. A second piece of advice would be to be patient in building the relationships. As much as you might feel as a grower that you're coming to the market with something brand new and super quality and you have all this in, uh, invested in, in excitement about your product, more than likely there are other people in the market selling that same product. So when you're approaching a new customer and you want, as a grower, approaching myself or another wholesaler, you're going to either have to augment or displace a vendor. So that's going to take time. That's a, a, a relationship building exercise, a trust building exercise, and both of you have to understand expectations and build that relationship around lots of questions about what they one is quality, what they can provide, how often will they buy, all these kind of questions. And those, those answers to those questions um, take time. If you're growing on a local basis and shipping to local suppliers, I believe you have a unique opportunity to differentiate yourself from long distance shippers in other parts of the world by shipping properly hydrated, properly prepared products that are fresher and are gonna last better and perform better for consumers because the shortness of the shipping cycle and the, the proper handling of the product in the transportation cycle. Um, that's an opportunity I see that uh, local growers can really do differently than their competitors, even from uh, California. The labeling requirements really vary once again by uh, who is receiving the product. If your ultimate goal is to sell supermarkets or certain wholesalers in the marketplace, larger wholesalers, you're probably going to have to do a few more steps than simply packaging the product in a bucket and put it there. You may have to be required to do things like barcoding or creating purchase orders. Uh, box labeling with purchase orders on them so that they can be received appropriately at the store level or at the warehouse. Now, if you want to sell to a smaller wholesaler or a local florist, you're probably not going to have to do much more than simply mark a box with how many bunches and what the variety is. Although I would say I would encourage growers whenever possible to somehow demark what specific varieties they're growing. I think there's an advantage for a smaller grower uh, and especially a local grower to start saying, I'm not selling sunflowers, I am selling sun bright sunflowers. That differentiates you. And if you more you differentiate yourself and make yourself the expert, it's going to be easier for you to enter the market on a better footing as an expert to larger sales. So ideally, the shipping from the farm to us as a wholesaler, or myself as a wholesaler, we would want to see refrigeration. We want to see, we don't really uh, want to see product coming in at, in the middle of the summer, 80 to 90 degrees. It's going to shorten the life of the flower. It's going to raise the temperature of my refrigeration. And uh, ultimately, it's not going to give the consumer a good product. When I started the farm, I didn't have refrigeration, so I had to cut the flowers, harvest them, process them, and get them to market right away. Eventually, I got a refrigeration unit, which has saved my life. Uh, <laughs> the other option in refrigeration is you can 
there is, you could take a room in your house or in your basement or whatever and install a mechanism called Coolbox and that'll cool the uh, area down that you need to be able to store your flowers until you can actually either afford refrigeration or get your flowers to market. Irrigation, we lay drip lines on everything. We found that it was um, the least expensive way to go. At one point we did overhead and it wasn't as effective for the plants. And then also we do fertigation. We uh, put liquid fertilizer into our lines so that the uh, annuals will have a little more of a boost. The tools you might need or the equipment you will need if you want to start flower farming. The large equipment is going to be a tractor and you also need a tiller on the tractor and a bucket on the tractor. So that's a very large investment, uh, but it's a wonderful investment because it's, it really helps you maintain your fields and get your work done faster. A sprayer is another piece of equipment that we use on the farm, and it's, you can go as big as you want or as small as you want, depending on your farm size. We started off with a small plastic sprayer that you can purchase at Tractor Supply, and then we upgraded to a larger sprayer that can mount on the back of our tractor. We had to purchase a trailer for the farm to haul all the mulches and that was a large piece of equipment so that was a large expense for the farm. Uh, you can find tools at any ag store and I'd like to show you some of the tools that we work with on the farm. This is a iron rake. Uh, iron rake is used to move heavy soil uh, so that you can level your ground out. Uh, it's a good rake to have, uh, it's handy, plus with the movement of using an iron rake it gives you muscles. So, I'm going to put this one down and move on to the next one. This is a valuable tool. As weird as it looks, it's called a stirrup hoe. I always called it a horseshoe hoe, but it's, um, it's basically used because it has a blade on both sides of it and you can use it by dragging it back and forth when you're trying to weed. And it's a valuable little tool. It costs about $19 at the hardware store or at the uh, ag store. Now rakes, everybody thinks a rake is all the same, but this is a flex rake. A flex rake is really important to have because it's very lightweight and soil can go through the, uh, the flex wires on them. And I find that if you weeded your bed out, uh, you need something to pick up all these weeds, but you'd wanna leave the soil into the bed. So the flex rakes are great that way. Now, I don't know, I'm sure everyone must have one of these in their house. This is a pitchfork. How are you going to pick up all those weeds that you weeded? And if you're on this farm, we have quite a few weeds. So we always use a pitchfork. They're great. And you get all this upper body strength. So being a farmer is a good workout. This is a wheel hoe. We use this all the time on the fields. It's efficient, it's fast, and easy to use. And you can still build big muscles with this. So, uh, this has a blade on both sides, and it runs down, it runs down the uh, lane, and you can clip all the weeds off very quickly and efficiently. It's one of a, a very simple tool, old tool, old style tool, but great to have. This is a Yang Cedar. Uh, I use this in the fields all the time when I need to sow my sunflowers or any of the fine seeds, um, anywhere from large to fine seeds. And basically uh, what it does is, this is your hopper right here, you put your seeds in, there's a roller in there, and in, on each roller that you purchase it's a different size uh, according to the seed. And then on the front plate it'll tell you the spacing of how far you want that seed to go. Uh, apart when you actually sow the seed. So this is a great tool. It, you can line yourself up in the field, get your seeds in quickly, and um, very efficient. Some of my favorite tools are a trowel, and this is really cool because it has a, uh, a little toothy uh, side on it, and uh, it's great for getting the weeds in and out and because you can cut the weeds on the side of it. So I love to use this and it has a good grip. You always want to make sure that when you purchase a tool it feels good in your hand and especially with your wrist. The next tool I have, this is like a claw, same concept. It's nice and comfortable in my wrist, so you can actually use it to dig out you know, some of the weeds that you're using. Most of these are used for weeds. Uh, you can tell we have many weeds on our farm. A knife. 
I always use a knife for cutting flowers when I'm designing flowers. So I keep this handy. I don't always use clippers. I use a knife when I'm actually putting a design together. So use these disposable knives and you can get them at uh, any, any type of uh, garden center area. Now clippers. It's always good to find yourself a good pair of clippers. Clippers need to be held, you know, with a smiley face like this. You don't want to try to clip your flowers like this. But anyway, you need a good clipper that's going to feel not too heavy on your wrist. You're out there a lot of times during the day clipping, and you're just clipping, clipping, clipping for hours. So you want that weight to be uh, minimal, but you also want a nice sharp blade. Clippers should be cleaned every time you, um, after you harvest. It's a good practice to get into, and all your tools should always be washed after harvest. Now I find having a pocket uh, to contain the uh, clippers is great because not only you know you clip this onto your pants you look really official not only you're out there in the field like this you're clipping around you get to you have to place the flowers down and where are you going to put your clippers always on the grass you lose them so it's great to have this little holder you look like John Wayne and you got your clippers so the next piece that I would like to go on to is lopping shears Lopping shears are, come in all different sizes. You can get smaller ones, longer ones. But for our sunflowers, because our stalks are very long and wide, um, we choose to use lopping shears because I can't always get the clipper around the actual stem of the uh, sunflower. So now that I have it back in my holster, and we're going to go back to the lopping shears. You just use these and make sure that you feel comfortable with these too, not too heavy. And it's always good for yourself to buy the tools. If you let someone else buy the tools, then you could be wasting money. And, and uh, the reason for that is my husband will buy me a tool and it won't feel comfortable in my hand at all. So I'm always like, thank you, honey, that's very special. But then I'll go to the store and get one that works for me. So I'm going to make a market bouquet for my farm stands and um, florist. So what I'm going to begin with is my sunflowers. And the reason why I have them down here instead of on the table is because I can visually see which sunflower is going to be a better choice to take. I'm going to start off with three. I'm going to take off some of the lower leaves just to clean it up a little bit. Next I'm going to add my zinnias. Now you can see I just broke this one off, but I'm going to actually break that off. And as I'm working the zinnias in the bunch, I'm angling each one into the middle of this imaginary point in the center of the bouquet. People love variety, so it's good to, if you are going to do bunches or mixed bouquets, um, you want to put a lot of variety in there. And then, of course, I use the ageritum. These are all nice little filler flowers, really cute. It gives it a nice added touch. I'm going to put a few stems in here. I mean, I know how much my market value for each bunch is, so I've kind of predetermined what I've decided to grow, and that way I predetermine my bunches to my customers during the winter time, and that way they know how much they're spending when they order the bunch. Next is the status. I'm going to use this as my collar, just a couple pieces of that. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure all my stems on the bottom look half decent. In my market bunches, some people use plastic, I use paper. Let's fold that up. And I've actually folded the piece of paper in a, like a um, triangle so that I can, I'm able to put my bunches in the water. And now I'm going to trim the bunch according to the size I want. Uniformity is important and there's your market bunch and you want to immediately put that into the water and then if you do four or five into your bucket. I've also have solution in this water. It's a beautiful presentation. So there's your bunch. I hope this video has been inspiring to you. Flower farming is very physical work and it's also very creative. It's a way of living life with nature. Flowers feed the soul and it's beauty by the bunch.